So welcome. Um, welcome to the second Young Onset Alzheimer's Disease webinar. Uh, it's, it's great that we've got so many of you that have joined already, and I'm sure there'll be more joining soon. I can't believe it's already our second meeting. Time seems to have flown since the last one. A lot of you I will have met already, but those of you I haven't, my name's Kath Mummery, and I'm a neurologist at the Dementia Research Centre. And I co-chair this support group for young onset Alzheimer's disease with Jackie, who is going to be speaking later and can introduce herself in more detail then. When we were planning our meetings after the inaugural one, we wanted to make sure that we reflect the needs and interests of everyone in the group, of all of our members. We make it really relevant to you. So we've considered a number of themes across, um, across the topics, and we want to hear from you in addition to that, about areas you would really like to discuss. So please, at any time, feel free to either drop things in the chat here or get in touch with us with areas you think we really need to talk about. What we thought might be useful would be to focus each meeting on a particular theme. So we considered things like impact on work of diagnosis, um, on family life and relationships, on financial and legal matters, on technology and adaptations, and on care system support. So today we're going to focus on the impact of an Alzheimer's disease diagnosis on work. We're going to consider the difficulties Alzheimer's diagnosis brings to those who are of working age, the implications for those who continue to work, the difficulties of giving up work sometimes at short notice, and um, there'll be lots of time to ask questions um, and bring up points that we perhaps haven't covered already. So these meetings are created for you and with you, and we really want to hear from you during the meeting and after the meeting um, about what we're doing well, what we might be doing better. And please always keep in touch with us, we want to hear. So I look forward to a really lively discussion today. Okay, so I'm now gonna hand over to the first session, which is being led by Nikki, who is the head of our um, direct support team, and Trish, who's one of her colleagues, and they're going to discuss adaptations at work. Thank you very much. Hello, good afternoon. Absolutely delighted to be here with you in our second meeting. I can't believe it's come around so quickly, but absolutely fantastic it has. Um, I'm Nikki Zimmerman, and with me today, I have got my fantastic colleague here, Trish, who Trish is our Rights and Entitlements Officer at Rare Dementia Support, and she is an absolute fountain of knowledge. So I'm so pleased to be presenting with you today. Um, I know that some of you may be a little bit disappointed because in the initial agenda, we did say that we were having um, a talk from somebody from occupational health about assessments. Unfortunately, they couldn't do that, but they have promised me that they will do a short video, which we will be displaying on our website. So that will be one of the future videos you'll be able to see. Um, so we're going to talk about receiving a diagnosis of young onset Alzheimer's disease um, while you're working and its, in, its implications. Now, I know for some of you watching today that this won't be completely and utterly relevant. Um, you may have already gone through that process um, and some people have had very different experiences as well. Um, but I do hope for some of you watching today, it is going to be a relevant topic and that you will be able to take something from it. So we know that dementia affects everybody very differently. And um, some people, you know, hopefully will be able to stay at work for a good while. Um, some people may have actually discovered some of their symptoms while they're at work, maybe through their colleagues, through their employers, or through their families, or even from themselves, finding that they were actually having difficulties um, with doing the jobs that they, they've been doing for many years. So really, it's, it's a case of what the job is that they're doing and what the difficulties are to that decision of whether you stay at work or you make the option to, to leave work. Um, and it, it's, it's not an automatic option, you know, there's lots of things to consider with this. I think one of the main things is to consider is once you've got that diagnosis, you know, what the implications were to getting being assessed and what the difficulties 
are and how that's affecting you and your family and actually having that frank and open talk with your family to weigh up all the pros and cons of whether you want to stay at work some people love their jobs you know they love that routine they think it's great for their physical and their mental well-being um, some people find that you know that the struggle is a bit too much and perhaps it's time to consider sort of the options so we're going to start looking at sort of how you go through that process today so Trish do you want to talk a little bit about what happens once you've got the diagnosis and you are at work yeah that's an interesting subject really because working age has changed we used to think of it up until 65 but many of us might choose to work for longer than that. So working age in itself is an interesting subject, but usually it's between, we're thinking between 16 and pension age, which is anything around 65, 68 at the moment. So when we think about working age and a diagnosis like dementia, as Nikki said, you may, you may expect to have a, a long working life beyond diagnosis potentially. And we need to think about how you're protected. So there is a law that protects you. It used to be the Disability Discrimination Act, and it still is in Northern Ireland, if you're tuning in from there. But in England, Wales and Scotland, it's the Equalities Act. And the Equalities Act 2010 protects you in the workplace. And there's a duty for public services to ensure that you're protected. And all organisations will try to protect and use uh, the Equalities Act to protect you from victimisation, harassment and discrimination, indirect or direct discrimination at work. There's been, you know, changes in our law over time and the United Nations Convention for the Rights of People with Disabilities, well, that came through and it was signed by, um, you know, published in 2006 and signed by the UK in, in 2009. We don't always do very well in the UK, I'm afraid, around the United Nations. And we're sometimes, um, you know, there's sometimes a lot of scrutiny about how the UK upholds those laws, but we are signed up to it and we are, and it is affecting, it is affecting how people are protected in the workplace, people with disability generally, not just in the workplace, but across health and transport and social but also an employment so there's kind of two laws that protect you and it's important to know them and the, the truth is it's quite clear it's quite clear that you are one of the nine characteristics if you're living with a disability and that should and, and must include dementia although there's been quite a lot of um, reports written and a recent one in 2018 that said still employers will quite often not see dementia particularly the early signs of dementia as a disability. And certainly the, the DWP didn't include the word dementia in their guidance in 2018. So it's not particularly helpful either. But despite the fact that dementia's struggled to make an appearance within the guidance, it is on the list. And you know the truth is disability is an impairment an impairment of a physical or mental impairment that has an impact on your day-to-day -day ordinary living. Now that's quite difficult to define because your work may not be your day-to-day -day ordinary living because it might be quite complicated, but generally speaking, you're defined as having a disability if you can't function on a day-to-day -day basis. But the truth of dementia is that you may function extremely well and you may function extremely well for many years. So does it become a disability straight away? Not necessarily, you know, but there are things that might be impacting your workplace. And it's important that we know that one of the best things we can probably do is inform our employer and inform them as we tell them, remind them that they're bound by the Equality Act. And perhaps they will um, ask you to have a meeting with them. And really the meeting and the Equalities Commission would suggest the first meeting is really a meaningful discussion and a meaningful discussion to, to, to find out what it is you need, what it is you want. And the truth is you may have decided that you need some help and the organization that you work for might have some ideas of what you might also need. So that is a meaningful discussion and hopefully an amicable one. And then following that, you would start making plans for what something's called reasonable adjustments in the workplace. And it could be that you might need to work in a quieter space, have flexible working hours. These are the examples. It's not a finite list, but the examples might be more rest periods, 
quieter space, maybe a buddy at work, somebody that helps remind you of things, or indeed you might use assistive technology, something that, you know, calendars that pop up reminders, things that help you with memory lapses potentially that you might have during the day. And all of these reasonable adjustments should help you integrate into the workplace, which is the idea. And people cannot discriminate against you because you have a diagnosis of dementia. Um, and absolutely, if in fact you are under, under some pressure from colleagues or HR around this, and it's because perhaps your behavior uh, is considered difficult, and because of your dementia, people are harassing you, you would have a case to be heard really. And it's worth having a discussion with your employers because maybe it's possible for some people, people at work have already noticed maybe some things have happened. And so maybe it's helpful for your employers to know, because hopefully most people you work with will try and adapt and go, oh, now we know. Now we can be a bit more patient and a bit more supportive. And thinking about ways that you can change your work practice, change your role, or move on to think about a different role in the workplace that might be a bit more, a bit less pressured perhaps. But of course, I'm gonna go back to Nikki now and ask you the question, Not you know, sometimes, People might want to leave work. They might decide themselves they want to leave work because they have other plans. So what do you reckon, Nikki, that might be? Thanks, Trish. And that's great. You know, there are lots of options, you know, in the workplace, like you said, and those discussions are really important. But yeah, you might want to take that option of, you know, you've been working in that job for many years. You've been getting up and getting on the train at 6.30 every morning in pre-COVID times, commuting into London and, you know, doing that job. But, but you've really thought, now I've done enough of that. And actually, it's some time for me, me and the family. Um, you know, it's... There are alternatives out there, but what the alternatives are is a lot of space during your day that you need to fill and you need to fill them with meaningful activities. So it's important to, when you are planning to, again, have a chat with your family and friends about sort of what you can do. There might be that big welcome. Oh, great. He or she's going to be at home more. You know, we can get things done on the house. We can do the garden. We can go and visit all those countries that, you know, we wanted to do perhaps after COVID time, because I think we might be stuck with the UK and the Balearics and Malta at the moment. But, you know, it's that planning ahead of putting some, making good use of that opportunity for that time. But also some people decide when they leave work, they still want to give back lots of things. So volunteering is another option. Just because you're not working in that job, in that role that you did, it doesn't mean you don't have any skills. You've still got lots of skills and lots of things to give. So, you know, we know many people that have stopped work, but they've gone into doing really meaningful uh, voluntary roles. Um, Another thing people have found as well is new hobbies and new skills and new talents. There might be a budding artist in there, you know, who knows? But I think what the important thing is, is don't think I'm going to give up work and go home and do nothing. You know, really look into this as an exciting opportunity and turn it around and make it meaningful for you. Now, I'm very aware of this, that leaving work does have financial implications for you. And, um, you know, it's a different scenario for everybody out there. So, Trish, can I come back to you now so you can talk about, you know, the financial implications of uh, giving up work? Absolutely, because there are some jobs that you do and maybe we have to recognise that some jobs are not compatible with dementia and talking to your employers about having a cognitive change might mean that you do have to change the role completely or you might have to leave your leave your job, you might be forced out and the jobs that are listed as not being acceptable for people with cognitive impairment would be the armed forces, working on a ship or plane, and I don't think that just means either being the pilot or the skipper. I think if you work in those areas, then, then you might not be able to continue working. But perhaps as you could go from the plane to land to ground staff. It doesn't mean you have to leave, but there might be roles that you can't do. So if your job is specifically a driving job, you can't continue to work in a driving job with this diagnosis. Um, you would also have to inform the DVLA, as we know. But the truth is, there are some roles that you can't continue with. You can't. Con you would also maybe have to change your role dramatically if you worked in the health service. So, for instance, maybe as a surgeon 
or maybe as somebody who's giving very important information or really complex work. So the truth is there are some jobs you can't do. So there are times when we are forced out into this pleasurable life that Nikki has suggested we can absolutely go for, but you know, money's gonna be tight potentially. Now, the thing to do is look at your contract. Are you expected to leave work? If not, they can't force you out unless you're operating machinery, driving or part of the armed forces, etc. Other than that, your contract might let you know. You could also look at your pension, your works pension, and see if you can start withdrawing that early. And that could help you continue to live a comfortable life. But for those of you that don't have pensions and are relying on waiting for a state pension, we have to start thinking about the world of benefits. The benefits that you might be more you know, hearing about is universal credit, but actually you might also get employment as support allowance as a possibility. And, you know, thinking about employment support allowance can be helpful. There is a contributory one, and that is where you're get um, it's a minimal amount of money, uh, usually paid uh, monthly. But it's, you know, without a doubt, it's, you know, it's not taxable. Um, uh, but it's, it, it's not a great amount of money. It's not going to keep you afloat if you're using, used to living a different way. Uh, although, you know, changing in your lifestyle is probably vital here. And as Nikki said, chatting to your family, discussing what you no longer can afford, perhaps is necessary, changing how you live a little. If you've got a very good pension, that might not happen. But if you don't have a pension, benefits are going to have an impact on you financially. There's no point in us in this webinar painting a too glorified picture. It will be difficult. But, you know, there is... Um, Universal credit is the new is the new term for ESA. It's income related, and that's um, slightly different from the contributory, which is you know, you know, is taxable. It's non means tested, but it's a small amount of money. The income related, well, that's slightly different. That is means tested. So if you have good assets, good savings, you're actually unlikely to qualify for that. Um, and it's not taxable. So you know, it's a swing and a roundabout. If you're quite comfortably in your pension, in a works pension, you're probably not going to have to worry about that. If you need to think about it, you're going to have to get advice much bigger than this quick chat. You can talk to us at RDS and we can give you direct support on this. You can go online. Other, other services uh, will help you and give you direct information about benefits. You will need to learn them all because they're quite complicated and they're quite convoluted. And as you go on benefits change, there can come a point where you might start to need and, and expect some care potentially, at which point you'll be looking at personal independence allowances and you'll be thinking about the payment for that. That's called PIP usually. And these words will become more familiar to you as you get to need them. And when you first get diagnosed, it's not something you're thinking about straight away. You may not qualify for a lot of these benefits until later on. And really it's as they as you change your benefits change and then you get more advice so i think the best thing i can say is that you know when we think about what we need in the future is we take each step at a time thank you and nikki you wanted to move on to the next pit i, I think. think that's really wise it, it really is taking it a step at a time and like we're always here and that's one thing with the rare dementia support team we don't discharge people you can come to us anytime so i hope that was useful for you we're going to move on now to a fantastic recording that was done um last week with jackie and john so alicia is going to share that for us one of the ways in which we define young onset alzheimer's is just that idea that um, young onset applies to people who uh, are still working age when they receive their diagnosis. And that is, to a certain extent, the theme of what we're talking about today, um, the relationship between um, young onset and the working world. And to launch our discussion with Vanessa and John, um, just want to say that they've got a very, very powerful story to tell us about what happens at the point when you are, receive a diagnosis, when you're still in the world of work. So it's fantastic to have both of you here today, John and Vanessa. And I just wonder if you could begin by just telling us, John, a little bit about the work that you did and, uh, and your role 
um, at the, around the time that you received your diagnosis? Um, I was the police officer, I joined the Met in 2000. Um, I worked for 18 years in the Met, doing several different jobs. I worked on undercover drug unit, I worked on public order, um, and I finally did my last five years working for specialist protection, which you and I previously would have known as just a bodyguard. My job there got me travel around the world. Um, I went to uh, Jerusalem. I went to... Can I ask the state? Uh, no. Yeah, lots of travel. Yeah, so, so yeah, lots of travel. Mm. Um, I noticed something was wrong with me when I start, started noticing some things that I'd see my mother do. And my mother died, died in 2004. Mm. And after she died, we thought that might be the end of Alzheimer's in our family. Um, but then my older sister turns out to have it. Um, I have, I have it, and I've got two smaller sisters who might have it as well. Going back to your work, it was like a physical symptom that first kicked it in, didn't it? Yeah, I, I always had problems with my knees playing playing rugby, um, and I got bounced from pill pillars of post uh, at hospital with them trying to identify this problem I had with my right knee. And then it, it migrated into a kind of limp. That for you found difficult walking. Yeah, my my walking came, became difficult. Mm. I started struggling at work um, because I couldn't pass the fitness test mm. um, to carry a gun. Um, I was generally I I knew that there was something wrong. Mm. And they all were, were quite good at adapting with you, weren't they? Well, work. Mm. Work were, was excellent. The, I was put under the care of another very senior officer. I mean, what, what, you're, what you're explaining to us is the fact that you had what was a really responsible job. Um, and, and if you were an armed officer at some points, you know, obviously one where there was huge amounts of responsibility attached to that. And the point comes when you begin to think, well, can I actually continue in, in this role possibly? And you began to talk about the kind of support that you had mm. and some of the changes and adaptations they began to make in the workplace. Was that really helpful for you? It was, yeah. They, I, they gave me, a senior officer who was assigned to me, who knew that I was having a problem with my leg, didn't know what it was, but... You were given a job where you didn't have to move around so much. Yeah, right? they, they took me off firearms, yeah. which was hard to accept because it, you know, that's, that's telling me that I'm not physically capable enough mm. to do this. Yeah. Um, I ended up on a, a, yeah, a surveillance unit um, working around uh, Palace Green mm. up in London. What I'm picking up from, from what you're saying is that, first of all, there's the, there's the shock of the diagnosis. Then there's the fact that you received what really sounds like some quite positive support and some adaptations that made it possible for you to continue. But possibly the creeping feeling that maybe you didn't want to carry on in the same way. Um, I, I, I couldn't. I, I, my knee was getting so wonky mm. and holding me back. Mm. And I, they still hadn't really done me a diagnosis. Mm. Oh. And they thought they thought it they thought it might be like a stress related thing. Yeah, stress related thing. Yeah. Or uh, that's very common, isn't it? Yeah. Mm. Um, so I think John had a series of 
like a whole intensive course yeah with psychotherapy yeah cbt mm. and things mm. which helped a little but it didn't make a massive difference no. mm. and then eventually you had an, a subsequent scan which i think with john's history that kind of confirmed that his physical symptoms were probably as a result of Alzheimer's. And was that the point where you decided to resign and that you were going to leave? Yeah, yeah I, I still, yeah. At, the at the time, um, I was basically spending my work day sitting in a van, mm. running the control, yeah. because I couldn't move with any pace. Mm. Um, so I, I was starting to think, how am I going to deal with this? Yeah. So that, that, that was the point where I really had to go and see someone higher up the chain mm. who I'd had to go foot and frank with. So you literally um, came home one day and said, yeah, came home at I've talked about everything, I'm not going back. Yeah. yeah. And I went, what? <laughs> yeah. But that's such a brave decision. Such a brave decision, and I think, uh, you know, in, in our experience, my husband's experience, that I think, though, however long it is, it could be months, it could be years, before you actually know what the problem is. And it, it, it's only when you know what the problem is that you can really take hold of it and, and sort of say, right, you know, I'm going to make my own decisions rather than being sort of pushed around and... Um, others working around you in a way. I, I, my, my main fear was that I was going to been, be told, right, okay, um, you come off any, any role that's public facing. Yeah. And we'll put you in the cupboard at the back issuing eye drops for people who've got grit in their eyes or something, some oh. made up job. And that, that, the police is very good for that. If you want to, to stay at work mm. with a, a condition like mine and, and, and any other, That's as long as you're prepared to go in, you know, just they'll find you something. Yeah, they, they will find you something to do. Mm, mm. Um, but I, that can I can do that. You decided that you didn't want to be found something to do, so yeah, it's like you decided to resign. So. So um, I hear that the actual day of your leaving and the mode of your leaving was rather wonderful. Would yeah. you like to tell us about that? Yeah, that was great. It, it was all organized by the people that I used to work with. Um, and it, really it was more for the kids mm. than for me. Um, we used to run the protection packages of cars and bikes to pick up VIPs and ambassadors and so on and so forth. Um, so we took uh, my son um, and, me. and my wife. <laughs> uh, so we had, it was meant to come from our front door, but it was particularly icy. So they came to the bottom of our road with a big, two big Range Rovers. And how many bikes do they have? Four. Four, yeah, three. With the lights on. And, we, and what's it called? It's the special escort group. Yeah. Took us up to, from our front door, all the way up through town with blue lights and whistles. Mm. Um, and it was so, nice, nice to see that, because yeah. that's, that's, it was part of my job. Yeah. So I could finally get to sort of tell Vanessa or Vanessa that would see what it, what it was that I used to do every day. Fantastic. And the fact that the children could see it as well and that, you know, may, yeah. maybe so living with Alzheimer's or whatever, it's about finding the good bits, isn't it? And, and yeah. things like it that a, happen. It was a great day. Great we day. got a tour of Scotland Yard and a personal meeting mm. with the commissioner. It and was very, very talked very highly of me yeah so i don't know who she was speaking to <laughs> so i mean mo moving on to sort of slightly more prosaic matters i mean you, you had this leaving and so you you made the, the positive choice 
And then, of course, maybe, Vanessa, there's things that you want to say about this, but when you, when you give up, there's financial implications, aren't there, in terms of sort of hacking your way through the labyrinth of um, benefits and, you know, what happens around pensions and things and so on. Is there anything that you'd like to tell us about that? I think if you've done a been off work sick for about a year, mm. in that year kind of navigated the benefits route. Mm. I think I traipsed up to the Citizens Advice Bureau in, you know, one day just to have a face-to-face -face discussion. And like mm. we said, she they kind of told you basically what you can't get. And <laughs> so I think we had that bit in order. And then we really didn't know what John's pension would be pretty much until it actually happened. So mm. that was pretty stressful. Mm. You know, where we were thinking we were gonna have to sell our house, we're gonna have to mm. change how we live our lives drastically. Um, and we had a family friend who knows loads about pensions. So with it, they gave us a pack maybe like a month before it was all gonna happen with different mm. options of lump sums versus annual salaries. And so it's quite a lot to consider. Anyway, so we essentially took a, a friend's advice as to what to do. And actually it's ended up being fine. But it was just the not knowing bit until mm. it actually happens is quite stressful. One of the things which is particularly relevant, I think, for people living with young onset forms of dementia is the fact that the whole system is wrapped around much older people. Mm. And uh, so, you know, taking those um, expert advice and going to the citizens advice sounds like a very sensible thing to be doing they point you in the right direction yeah but yeah. we found that there's no single place you can go no there's no so one-stop shop yeah. yeah so you don't know how certain effect benefits will affect other benefits yeah yeah i mean it ends up that we're basically not entitled to anything because i'm still working yeah and you get the only thing that isn't means tested is the pip which yeah. you've got Exactly. had that before and there's an art to filling in the pip and so on isn't there so yeah. yeah anyway all of that you managed to get through it but it obviously at a very emotional time sort of adds to the stresses and strains doesn't it in one way yeah I mean, you don't really imagine you're going to be sorting all that out at this point in your life and you know we've got young children talking about pensions it all just seems a bit weird but yeah. we kind of got on with it and it's fine now well, my, my son and my daughter don't notice that I don't have a job. <laughs> <laughs> they, um, they, never go, they never ask me why I don't go to, to work, which I, I'm waiting for them to... Yeah, they, Jackson knows you were a policeman. Yeah. But now John's just around and it's, it's really nice. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you know, I mean, maybe that brings us on to a really important point. You know, obviously it's very mixed, but... Are there any key messages that you would like us to take away from sharing your experiences about this? Don't get down about it. it it's invariably coming. Mm. And I spent a long time thinking about it in my head as to what I was going to do the day after I was no longer a police officer. Mm. And then I, was, then I just let it go. I could sing, sing there, couldn't I? But that wouldn't be very good. Mm -hmm. um, let it go. You said it was a relief. Yeah, and it was a relief. Because mm -hmm. I'd spent these two years getting passed from pillar to post in, by the NHS mm -hmm. um, and by internal. It was nice that you chose when it happened. Yeah. yeah. And I think for us, you know, we've got three young children. Life feels okay, doesn't it? It does. It's manageable. We've got John around who looks after the children at the moment while I'm working. And actually it feels we've got a happy house. It feels quite nice. Mm. I think... That's a really perfect moment to draw this to a close. And I just want to say thank you so much for sharing your experience of this huge life change and uh, for sort of helping to share with us the fact that by taking the initiative and doing it on your own terms, it can actually be a very, not hugely positive maybe, but you know, it can be a very constructive 
experience you're concerned. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Such a lovely message. Um, and those two sessions were brilliant. Such an informed section, Trish and Nikki, on workplace considerations and diagnosis. Um, and the lived experience with John and Vanessa, I mean, I know them both very well, and it's a beautiful example of how they, someone can be supported through that process. I love the story of the blue light escort. What a lovely thing for your children to see and to, and to have a memory about. And uh, John's key message, don't get down about it, take control and choose when and how things happen. I think um, that's really positive. So moving on to our next session, uh, which is going to be led by Nikki and Karen. And they're gonna tell you a little more about the small peer support groups for young onset Alzheimer's disease that they are developing. Thank you, Nikki. Thank you so much, Kath. And yeah, what an inspiring story that was. Absolutely amazing. Well, I'm delighted to be back here with another member of my team. I am so lucky to have such wonderful, experienced staff on my team. It's amazing. So I'm really going to introduce Karen to you, and she's going to tell you a little bit about the work that she's been doing since she joined RDS um, earlier this year. Karen, do you want to introduce yourself and then talk a little bit about um, the developments you've been doing? Thank you very much, Nikki. Um, hello, everyone. Um, I'm so excited to be here with you all today. Um, I wanted to share with you our plans initially to launch a Young Onset Alzheimer's peer support group um, and to invite people living with a diagnosis of Young Onset Alzheimer's disease to join us for this new peer support group. Now, this group is just for you. Um, I'm sorry, um, it's not for family caregivers. It really just is a special place and a time for you, the person that is living with this diagnosis. So we plan to launch um, a meeting, a monthly meeting, and we do it via Zoom. And the idea is that it'd be for about an hour and a half. Um, and we'll be creating this sort of opportunity for you to meet others living with young onset Alzheimer's disease and for you to share your stories, support each other in this really, really safe place. Now, we already have a couple of peer um, support groups for the person living with a diagnosis. So what we have currently is FTD and PPA, and they run monthly, and I'll tell you about those in a second. And we also have two PCA groups as well, which again are just run for the person experiencing that condition. And I must say, in my experience of co-facilitating our monthly online PCA support group, and also attending the FTD and PPA monthly online peer support group, it's such a privilege to be there with them all. Um, they're such an amazing group of people. I'm just blown away um, by the positive nature of these groups, the kindness and the support that everyone shows each other. Um, they're all so empowering and it's a joy to witness, I must say. And it's a delight when you actually see those friendships blossom within the group. You know, it is the highlight of my week, it really is. Um, now our PCA groups that we run, people attend from as far away as America. So it doesn't really matter where you live. Um, we clearly support everybody in the United Kingdom, but it will support anybody from all over the world um, experiencing rare dementias that we cover at RDS. And in fact, in our FTD and PPA group that runs monthly online, people attend from Switzerland and Singapore. However, we do have two people that live literally just around the corner from each other. So they're able to go and meet for a cup of coffee. So really there are no barriers for you actually joining um, these peer support groups. But today it's really this new one that I wanted to talk about, which is this young onset Alzheimer's disease. So um, I'm really excited that we're gonna get that off the ground. So how can you access this new group? So some of you will already be members of RGS, so that's fine. And Alicia, in a moment, when I finish, you'll put up a slide that will have contact details for you. But don't worry if you don't write it down because she'll send it out um, in an email after we finished um, the support group today. But if you're not a member, 
what we ask is that um, you sign up to be a member of RDS and then you'll get a, a support call from our direct support team. And then they'll be able to refer you into the new peer support group. Now, what's important to say is this new onset Alzheimer's disease group um, will be supporting people with memory difficulties. So if you are young and you have the diagnosis of PCA or FTD or PPA, just know that those groups are there for you. Um, and you can write to me directly if you're a member of RDS so that you can actually join those PCA or PPA um, and FTD groups. Now, once we have enough interest to join these groups, I will write to everybody and find out what day of the week works best for people, what time of day, that might be morning, it might be afternoon, or for some groups that we run, it might be in the evening if you've got work commitments. We want to work with you and come up with the best time. We will go with the majority, um, and we hope that we can launch this group late summer, early autumn. It's going to depend on the interest we get. I'm also delighted to say that my co-facilitator on this new support group is going to be our very own Nikki Zimmerman. So it will be double trouble at these groups. Um, so we're really looking forward to hearing from you so that we can actually get this group off the ground. Um, so I think, Nikki, that's probably it from me. Have I missed anything out about this group? Not at all. I think that's a great sort of synopsis of what the group Group's going to be. Um, we, I do know we've got lots of health professionals watching today. So if you are a health professional and you're supporting people with young onset Alzheimer's disease, please encourage them to become members so they can attend these groups. That would be absolutely fantastic. Um, and just a little note that the um, slide we're going to put up, this will be attached to the email that comes out next week rather than today. So please don't look for it today. We will be sending an email next week once we've got the meeting recording link and all the resources together but these just a few details from Karen it's got Karen's name on here and the email address but for any um, queries at all you can always just use the normal email address at contact at rare dementia support and we can filter this over to Karen no problem so we're really as Karen said excited about this and hoping that you're going to join us thank you so much Karen Thank you very much. Lovely to be with you all today and I'll say goodbye. So now I'm going to hand you over to Kath Mamre, who is the uh, clinical lead for the YOAD group and an absolute fantastic uh, cognitive neurologist. And Kath is going to give you an update, uh, a research update on um, Alzheimer's disease. So I'll just hand you over to Kath now. Okay, so I'm going to give you a quick update on where we are with clinical trials in Alzheimer's disease. And um, I have to say there's an awful lot to talk about. So if we don't get through everything, please, please, please get in touch with us via the clinical trials inquiries line or via RDS. And I will do my best to let you know what's happening. The first thing to say is that during the pandemic, when a lot of things stopped completely, we never stopped with clinical trials. Um, thanks to some amazing participants and our fantastic team, we have been continuing to conduct research into treatments for Alzheimer's disease throughout the past 16 months, which is um, an incredible achievement for the team and, and for the amazing people that have been in these studies. So thank you to them all. So this um, pie chart that you can see in front of you uh, shows basically all of the drugs that are currently in development in Alzheimer's disease. And you can see there are quite a large number of them. Um, if you look at those that are in purple pie section and green pie section, those are all the drugs currently in development that are trying to change the course of the disease. It's also important that we treat symptoms and those in the orange pie section are drugs that are trying to help control symptoms. But you can see that there's a huge effort in trying to change the way the disease affects the brain, which is really important. In addition, there are, whoops, let's go back, shall we? There we go. In addition, you can see there are a lot of different colors. And the reason for that is because there are a lot of different targets that we're trying to change the Alzheimer's disease. So the, the three main ones at the moment, but there are many more, Amyloid, which as you know, is the primary problem in Alzheimer's disease, amyloid plaques buildup, has been what 
this, but we are also looking at drugs that target tau, the other abnormal protein in Alzheimer's disease that builds up and causes the disease, and inflammation amongst other areas. The more targets we look at, the more likely we are to have success in finding a drug that works. So this is really good news that we're looking at so many different areas. So I mentioned amyloid and trying to remove amyloid from the brain in the hope that you can slow down the course of Alzheimer's disease. And this has been a dominant method for a long time, using antibodies that are produced outside the body and then injected to try and mop up either soluble forms of amyloid or the plaques that are in the brain. Now, the advantage is you know what you're giving, you know that if it goes wrong, you can quickly reverse it. But this involves lots of infusions over, over time. Uh, it takes a lot of time commitment and it's expensive. However, there are a number of drugs that have been trying to reduce amyloid in the brain by clearing it out. And you can see that two of those have now fallen by the wayside because they were shown not to work in big studies. But there are a number that are currently undergoing active investigation. If you're going to have a drug that clears amyloid, you need to be aware of the sorts of problems you're going to have potentially with that drug. So if you take amyloid out of the brain, you can leave it vulnerable to adverse effects. For example, you can develop focal swelling in the brain and you may occasionally develop small hemorrhages in the brain. Now this doesn't happen very often, but it is possible. And therefore we need to understand it. And there's been a lot of work done looking at why this might happen. We know that high doses can cause it. We know that there are certain people that are more at risk of having this, for example, if you're an FOE4 carrier. But we also know that usually it's mild. If you stop the dose, it reverses and goes away completely, as you can see here. And it's often asymptomatic. There are no symptoms at all. So what's important is that people have scans regularly when they're having these forms of treatment in trials or even in clinical practice. So the first drug I'm going to talk about is something that you will probably have heard an awful lot about recently. This is what was called aducanumab and is now called aduhelm. Now this drug has been mired in controversy throughout the past year, and I'm not going to go through the detail of that, although I'm very happy to talk to you over a coffee about it. But essentially, there were two very large studies that were stopped prematurely, but the data from those studies showed that the amyloid in the brain was massively reduced in both of the two studies. In addition, it suggested that there were also downstream effects. In other words, that reduction in amyloid caused other changes in the disease. And in one of the two studies, there were cognitive changes. In other words, it slowed down cognitive decline in one of the studies, but not in the other. Now, after an awful lot of discussion and debate, which is ongoing, this drug was given conditional approval on the 7th of June of this year, so this month. And it was given something called accelerated approval, which recognizes by the FDA in the United States that this is a massive unmet need, that we have to find treatments for Alzheimer's disease. It recognized that it changed the biology of the disease, but as yet, there hasn't been evidence as far as the FDA are concerned, that's sufficient to say it works clinically. So they have insisted that there will be another trial to confirm that clinical effectiveness that we think we saw in one of the two studies. So this is the first drug approved for changing pathology in Alzheimer's disease. And that's the first time I've been able to say that in a talk. So that's incredibly exciting. We wait and see what happens in Europe and the UK about decisions as to whether this drug is approved. And if it is, it's gonna be really important to discuss with our patients who would benefit from it, at what stage people might benefit from it and how we're going to use it. So there's a huge amount of work that's gonna to need to happen on the basis of this. Um, and we're just beginning that now. There are other drugs that are not far behind in terms of potential. So these three, gantanerumab, lecanemab, and donanumab, all do the same sort of thing and all have shown similar effects. They've shown a significant reduction in brain amyloid. They've shown potential for change in the disease process itself downstream. And two of them have shown changes in cognitive decline. So as a result, 
there are large phase three studies trying to prove these effects in these drugs. And two of them just this week, in fact, yesterday, have filed in terms of getting breakthrough treatment from the FDA. And what that means is that they can have an accelerated approval process if they show enough evidence. So there's an awful lot happening in the amyloid world. It's changing very, very fast, but we mustn't forget other treatments that we might want to use. So I mentioned tau right at the beginning. We know it's important in the development of the disease. We know that if we suppress it, we might be able to slow down disease progression and that potentially that might be later in the course of the disease than when we can treat amyloid, which is very early, because as tau builds up, we see the symptoms change alongside that. So we may be able to treat later and successfully. But we're much earlier in the game with tau treatments. There are immunotherapy treatments, antibodies, like the ones with amyloid, but we've also developed vaccines. So not dissimilar to COVID vaccines, there are now active immunizations being trialed against tau to try and get the body to produce antibodies that will then mop up the tau that is causing problems. There are benefits and cons to using an immunization. The cons being that it can have a long lasting adverse effect if it does have a problem. So we do have to be very careful. And this study, which I'm now recruiting to is an early phase study in mild Alzheimer's disease where we give vaccinations. And so far it's safe. And so far it seems to cause antibody development, which is good and to reduce tau, but it's very early days. So we need to watch this space. And there are other treatments instead of clearing up tau by using antibodies, we might want to reduce tau production. And using methods like silencing the gene that leads to development or production of the protein tau is one method. And this uses a drug, which is a synthetic copy in some ways of genetic material and it binds to the message that's produced from the gene and prevents that message being translated into that protein. So reducing the amount of protein and hopefully reducing the pathology that's in the brain. This was developed on the back of some amazing results in diseases such as infantile spinal muscular atrophy, where instead of this hideous disease, which kills people by the age of two, Instead of that happening, giving a drug that was similar to these gene silencing drugs caused an improvement in their motor development. And if given early enough, it actually caused them to be normal. So this, in this particular disease, was effectively a cure of a fatal disease. And that potential is hugely exciting. So we've been trying this treatment in Alzheimer's disease now for four years. We've completed the first phase of that study. I'll be reporting the results in a few weeks time in the AAIC main Alzheimer's conference. But so far, and you get the preview of this, it's shown that the drug is safe and it's shown that it does seem to be reducing tau levels. So we have to wait and see what further studies show as to whether this translates into clinical change. But I think it's very promising and we'll see what happens. Finally, just to mention that we are looking at other targets such as inflammation and trying to reduce that because we know that inflammation can increase amyloid accumulation. And again, we're about to start a study next week in mild Alzheimer's disease using this antibody to reduce inflammation to see what happens in the brain using that. So there is an awful lot going on. We haven't been quiet during the past 16 months. In fact, it's, it's really extraordinary what's happening right now. We have the first ever treatment that tries to change the course of the disease. It's been conditionally approved and now has to confirm efficacy. It's a new era in our treatment trials, and I really believe that. It's a massive opportunity for our research and for our services. There will be challenges with new treatments, but that's a good problem to have. And we've got new methods all the time to try and enhance the way that we're targeting Alzheimer's disease. And that makes it even more important that we diagnose people early and accurately and really support them so that we can go through this process together. So I just want to say thank you to everybody that participates in these trials and thank you to the team. And if you have any questions about any of this or other questions about trials, there's an email here that we can put in the follow up email as well so that you can um, find out more. Thank you very much.
Well, many thanks indeed, Kath, for that fantastic overview and summary. Um, and hi to everyone else. My name is Seb Crutch. I'm one of the psychologists involved at RDS and the Dementia Research Centre. And it's my great pleasure now to welcome on the uh, other members of the question and answer panel who are going to try and tackle the uh, insightful comments, uh, reflections you may have on anything you've heard so far, and also any question that you care to throw at the panel to keep them on their toes and to unpack a little bit further the topics we've been talking about. So that might be anything to do with um, living with uh, young onset AD, generally there might be particularly questions relating to the topics of work um, and also medical symptom and all other facts about uh, the nature of the condition how you've experienced it or forms of support either that you're looking for or that you found helpful and are looking to share with other people so thanks i think everyone will recognize everyone on the panel from um, earlier on in the meeting so we'll crack uh, straight on if that's okay um, and if you don't mind, Kath, I might, even though you've just been speaking, I might come straight to you with the first question, um, which was broadly about um, severity of dementia. So it comes in two parts. I'll throw the first part to you and the second part perhaps over to, um, to Trish and, and Nikki, maybe. Um, but the first question was um, in relation to measures of dementia. Um, how do the different uh, tools that people use, so things like the mini mental scale, the Adam Brooks cognitive assessment or ACE, um, the blessed dementia scale and so forth, um, how do they compare um, and how should they progress over time? What, do, what does one expect to see if you're using those kind of tools or if they're being used on you? a really tricky question. <laughs> I mean, you, we use these, we use a number of these measures and they're used in different ways. Um, the most reliable thing to say, I suppose, in terms of over time is trying to be consistent with the measure that you're using, regardless of which it is, and the person, if possible, that is measuring. Um, because all of these measures have strengths and weaknesses. They might pick up something in somebody that's got a typical memory problem, for example, they might be very useful at showing that you have an issue with retrieving information or rapid forgetting. If you have someone with a language difficulty that is doing the same, same measure, they might show a very different pattern of difficulties at the same level of severity in other measures. So I think it depends on what you're measuring and how you're measuring it, and you need to try and be consistent over time. Some people change functionally with very little difference across these scores. So I think the, the measures are only as useful if you take them in part with what the individual tells you, what their family tell you, and you use that as a composite to show you actually how things are changing over time. So never take I would I think it's not just me looking at other faces on the panel that uh, Kath's signal has slightly broken up so if she suddenly leaps back in then we will hear the end of her comment um, but I think she was I think there was going to be an element of um, use them where appropriate but equally take them with a little bit of a pinch of salt or take them in the context of everything else that you're experiencing and knowing sorry Kath we lost you for a moment there so I'm just guesstimating and interpolating how you would have finished that last sentence no that's absolutely right what I'll do well somebody else answers the next bit of make sure my signal is there. Thank you, that's great. I think the only thing I was just going to briefly add in compliment to what Kath was saying is that people often um, worry about or complain about the mini mental, for example, um, and say, and it's a bit like with email, people often say, you know, it's it's, imp it's imperfect, but equally rarely it, has it been bettered as a, as a form of communication. I think we feel the same about the MMC. There are lots of situations in which um, either it doesn't feel quite like it captures the picture 
um, or particularly if it's not administered in a sensitive way, it can feel like quite a um, disheartening experience for those who are on the receiving end of the questions. Um, but equally use, used appropriately, it can provide some useful information. I was just thinking, for example, about someone who I once had to deliver the MMSC with who had, as Kath was saying, a language problem. And for example, when we came to the, which month is it? It was October. They weren't able to find the word for October, but they could, were using their finger on the desk, sketch the number 10. So clearly indicating that they were able to be, that they knew the information I was seeking, but weren't able to convey it in the way that is typically expected. And so you, one would hope that um, these things can be administered with a bit of nuance and sensitivity. So um, related to that question, um, uh, someone, the same person was also asking, um, perhaps Nikki and Trishy might come on at this, about how we interpret the numbers. Um, so someone was saying, if someone declines from MMSE of 26 to 14, say in 10, over 10 months, should I start looking at care homes now or next year? So I think this relates to what Kath was saying about how much we interpret or over-interpret um, or risk over-interpreting numbers and how we need, perhaps need to take things in context. So someone, Nikki or Trish, who's declining on the MMSE quite rapidly and what, what our response to that should be. Shall I start on this and then we'll go on to Trish? I think a lot of people really put a lot of emphasis on this and they like some statistical data sort of go to and what does it actually mean? And actually, sometimes it's, it's a good thing to put that data to the side and say, well, how is your partner, your wife, your husband, your son, daughter, how are they different within those 10 months? What can they do what can't they do now to what they did 10 months ago? How is it actually impacting on their life? And, um, you know, going back to what Kath said about it's not all about the scores on that. It's about the collateral history that you're getting from that person in that family. So um, people's care needs do change, obviously, with sort of their cognitive problems. Um, so it's really important to, to look at what people's care needs are and to make sure those needs are met. Um, and they can be met in various different ways. As we know, some people will care for their loved ones all throughout the journey. Um, they will have extra care in at home. They will have family around them. Other people feel that they can't do that caring role. It's not an easy role at all. And so they will be looking for care homes. I always think it's a good idea to look at care, for care homes at an early stage to see what's out there and to see what's gonna meet the needs. But I think, you know, it, it's looking at those options as well. I was gonna hand over to Chris then, then she suddenly jumped across the table. Chris, do you want to add into that please? You're on mute. You're Sorry, on mute. Let me unmute. Yeah. Sorry. I think my signal might be jumping in and out a little bit. So I hope I'm clear. But I think it's true. I think that, you know, the 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 data is really important for the big number crunching. It's really important data. But for you as an individual family, really you start looking for the care that you need when you're not coping a little. And there might be a time when you think, in the future, I might struggle with this. And some people might suggest that love is not enough when it comes to the sharp end of dementia, potentially. And so we shouldn't ever really think that we're putting someone in a care home. That should never be the language that we consider. We're actually helping someone to get the care that they need in a care home because we can't do it at home. There's lots you can do at home before thinking a care home might be the answer. And that might be getting support from friends and family to a degree, although you can't usually be too grumpy if that doesn't turn up on time. Whereas if you start paying for care to come in, home care teams, and they can get longer and longer in hours. You can start with a day or two a week. You might even decide just to get to know someone who comes in once a week and helps with a bit of cleaning. But then after a couple of years, or maybe longer, they might start coming in every day. And then they you already have a relationship with them. The same with a care home really, before COVID, and hopefully now after COVID, hopefully we'll get through, I say after COVID, you know what I mean? When we, when we can live more ordinarily, um, I think we're living with COVID, but more ordinarily. Then maybe start looking at care homes, as Nikki said, as a drop-in, they might have an open day, they might have a fate, they might have a coffee morning, or they might do some, chair yoga or you know 
some sort of singing for the brain or something in a local care home and that might be a good thing to go and visit so you get to know the place a bit and it could be that you've got no intention of living there but it's a way of meeting other people who might also live in the area i'll um, stop there I'll, see thank you thank you so much i'll come to jackie and then over to kath if that's okay um just going back to the um testing idea um one thing that i found was that though the um mmsc is obviously you know, uh, a bit compromised in some of the ways that you've already said, Seb, is that um, it was actually useful in the sense that in the early years after diagnosis, um, you could see the trajectory that Tony was on. And that was the stage when they were holding back on um, prescribing Aricept until people were in the mid stages. But when Tony started on Aricept, it showed precisely how Aricept cushioned his fall for about 18 months when the, the line of decline sort of smoothed out. And then you could see when it stopped having any effect because then it started dropping on exactly the same trajectory as it had been at the start. So, you know, for whatever it's worth, that was quite an interesting insight into how the medication was helping him. But on the other thing, I do find it, very uncomfortable sometimes when you sort of look at articles that are written around these things. It sort of suggests that when you get to sort of 20 or 15 or 10 or whatever it is, that's the time to be looking for a care home because it just doesn't work like that in the real world. I mean, you know, Tony, Tony had been on a big fat zero for um, three or four years um, in the later stages of his dementia. And we still looked after him at home, um, you know, with, with some help and, and with some periods of respite in a care home. So I think that the carers, it's quite unhelpful to label certain points on these scores and sort of say, you know, this is what happens then, this is what happens then. There's no template for this. It's what you and your family and what the person with the diagnosis is that should guide the judgment, not sort of raw numbers, whichever scale or whichever set of tests you're using. Thank you, Jackie. That's such helpful context and such good examples that really emphasise that need for a sort of tailored approach, sort of all, all information, but in, in the right context. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Kath, I saw a, 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 an electronic hand up earlier. Did you want yeah. to come back in? Yeah, I, I did. And Jackie has actually um, just enumerated pretty much Oh, we're going to be robbed of what Kath was going to say. I'm sorry, Kath, it's still a little jerky and now it's paused. So uh, we will come to another question and then hopefully come back to Kath uh, in a few minutes. Um, so just in the meantime, let me move on. So Doug, um, who's a fantastic uh, member who's present in the meeting, um, has contributed a little bit of experience about uh, on the job and work front. Um, so Doug was explaining in his comment that he the issue had was he had was been getting a job. He'd often get to the contract offer stage or to an interview, um, and would mention after a successful interview the issue around young onset dementia and affecting vision, um, and. And the, the answer he got was always, oh, yes, we can accommodate that, wouldn't be a problem. And then in reality, the contract wouldn't come through or the offer um, wouldn't, wouldn't progress. Um, so it's, uh, I guess, a broad comment, uh, I guess, sort of underlying um, the question about how can we support people? Um, uh, how can someone, we can support someone with a young onset form of dementia or Alzheimer's disease and in, in that hunt for work, what's appropriate and how do we kind of gauge our expectations around it? Something obviously that you touched on, um, uh, Trish and Nikki, and I just wondered if any reflections on Doug's experience and whether that chimes with other people that you've supported. I'll hand over to Trish because we did, when we were preparing our talk for this, sort of get sort of thrown into this scale of what if you're going for a job? And um, she did sort of talk to me about it for at least half an hour. So I'll let Trish go on this one. Okay. Yeah, I mean, the truth is you you should be protected as an applicant in a job and you can ask in advance for adaptions to your interview. And the truth is the law, the employment law around this is how they can make adaptions for you for the interview. So they can make the interview at a time is more convenient for you. 
that if you have mobility issues that they might make sure it's on the ground floor and that might be a mobility issues of course can be affected by your dementia it could be that you might need to be um, interviewed in a slightly different way and you can expect all that as part of the interview but can you expect to get the job i don't think that many people in the experiences that you might be having would easily get a job saying i have dementia I think it's important to say that it's you, you need to inform any employers that you're applying for a job from that you have um, you have been diagnosed with a um, cognitive impairment. You don't have to give them the ins and outs of what that impairment is and that it's degenerative. They will therefore meet you at the time of the interview. You've informed them that you've got a condition that affects your brain. I think it would be expected to inform them if you're going to apply for a job that's on the list such as armed forces, the plane, the boat, the driving, you really wouldn't be applying for that job. I think you would know that that couldn't be a job that you would manage because of the risk. So you'd be looking at weighing up risks. I think transparency is always going to benefit you in the long run, because I think applying for a job, it's best to inform them, actually, it's a dementia. It may be very slow moving through my brain. I could be of extreme benefit to you in the organization and I think you're going to be interviewed like any other human and if the, you impress them in the interview as long as you've asked them to make the adaptions that you need for a decent chance in that interview that's the important thing and in that you're protected whether they give you the job or not let's be honest they're going to use whatever excuse they like to decide whether they've offered you the job or not it'd be very difficult for you to prove it was because of your dementia that they didn't offer you the job so i guess it's about transparency also let's not forget that there's a potential occasionally for you to work in a role where you can be in an advantage at living with a cognitive impairment because you might be an advocate or a supporter of other people going through the process so some jobs it might be advantageous my answer would be you may not get the jobs that you want you would have to be as transparent as possible and you should be protected to have a reasonable crack at the whip during the interview having the adjustments thank you trish really helpful and in-depth answer and i think also just emphasizes the need for us as a kind of community whether we are peers professionals whoever are just to sharing experiences positive experiences of people in paid and voluntary roles continuing to make a fantastic contribution in the way that we know so many of you do and can um, and so if you do have experiences or have met or seen other people working in roles contributing in roles um, which whether whether they've been adapted or not give both you know fulfillment and and purpose um, and, and and end product then we'd love to hear them and to share them through newsletters stories because so i think it's only by changing those kind of cultural assumptions around what people with dementia can and can't do that's um that will really try and change and shift this bias that people have so thank you um just briefly before we come to the next question um kath uh, uh has sent apologies for connection issues and was just going to add to the previous comment that Jackie was making um, to sort of endorse what she was saying uh, um, that it's longitudinal change change over time in an in an individual on a measure be it the MMSC or something else that's really most useful um, particularly for picking up when something unexpected is happening and using that as a prompt to seek further help or perhaps detect that some other health um, condition or other situation um, is, is awry and, and needs some treatment or action. So thank you, Kath. Uh, we'll, con we'll communicate in Morse code from now on, Kath. That's great. Um, good. Uh, next question, if that's okay, is to, is a, um, I will let whichever member of the panel would like to jump in first, um, is about anxiety. What support is available for someone with YOAD who may be experiencing anxiety? Who would like to come in on that? Shall I start and then we can pass Thank it around you. a bit? Great. Um, we, we, do, um, we do get a lot of calls, a lot of uh, emails from people who after um, diagnosis and normally quite soon after diagnosis or pre-diagnosis while they're going through the assessment of very high anxiety, which isn't surprising. It's it's something life changing. It's the unknown. You know, people have been working in their industry within their jobs for many years. And now that's 
going to have to change and their relationships are changing. Um, the roles are changing. So there's an awful lot of anxiety around um, you know, having a diagnosis of young onset Alzheimer's disease. And, and for carers as well, caregivers, you know, it's family members that they become very highly anxious of what's happening. We we have the direct support team. We um, we listen to people, we, we guide them. We have different services that we signpost them to. There's lots of counselling services out there. We run small group um, that aren't counselling, but it's sharing people's experiences. And I think that social isolation with anxiety of feeling the only one that's going through this can be really help sometimes with sharing that experience. And then of course, there's the different sort of um, counselling services that are out there, IAPT, um, and more professional and more dementia related services. They're very few and far between. We really know that we very much appreciate that that is such a gap. And we hope that sort of in time with RDS, we're gonna be able to you know, develop more services to fit that gap. Um, but it is a gap that's out there. Jackie, do you have any experience sort of with this yourself? Yeah. Um... I mean, I've got a couple of thoughts. I mean, the first one is around this notion of anxiety at the point of giving up work. And um, one thing that we haven't touched on this afternoon, um, there's been a sort of working assumption, which is about employment, but um, my husband, Tony, was self-employed. And that added a whole extra dimension of anxiety because, um, there wasn't any sort of HR system around, you know, the, the moments of his leaving work. Um, and he didn't have a diagnosis at the time. And so it was a massively anxious time on, on a number of fronts. Um, so one of the things which helped anxiety was being well informed and you know, actually having a diagnosis perversely. I can remember on the afternoon that he was diagnosed, Tony just saying that he felt relieved. And I said, why? And he said, because I know I'm not going mad. I think, you know, for quite a long time leading up to that point, he'd been um, hugely full of self-doubt, a feeling that the problems that he was having in his working life were to do with, um, you know, getting things wrong, that he'd failed in some sense. And so I think that the diagnosis was a, a sort of reassurance in a way, in the way that, you know, came across, I think, in the conversation that I had with, with John and Vanessa, that um, at least you know what you're dealing with. I, I think more broadly than that, um, you know, both, both for somebody with a diagnosis and for... Um, you know, family and friends and so on. I, I think trying not to spend too much time thinking about what might happen because, you know, live, live in the moment as far as you can. And I know that, you know, that might seem pie in the sky, but I know it worked for us that, that you can sit sort of catastrophizing about awful things that are gonna happen in the future, many of which actually didn't. Um, you know, but there were other some sort of surprising and interesting things that did happen. Um, you know, in, in, my, in my husband's case, you know, Trish, Trish has said it's not a good idea to fly a plane or whatever when, when you've got um, Alzheimer's. But equally, standing up in court and being a barrister is, is not necessarily a very good idea. Um, not least because it can lead to all sorts of problems about people... Um, um, querying judgments that have been made and so on and so forth. So um, he, Tony had to give up um, and that was a great loss, but bizarrely and quite unexpectedly, he found something new, which was that he developed a love of art. And, you know, for several years in the mid stage of his dementia, Tony identified as an artist. Um, and I would never in a million years have thought that that would have been part of Tony's life experience. And, and it was, and it was a very important one. Um, and, and then the other thing I would say in terms of anxiety is, is try and find some people who are in the same boat. Um, you know, young, young onset is, you know, rare relatively, otherwise we wouldn't have formed a group for it. And I think that, um, 
when you're alongside other people who are living different versions of it, that can be enormously reassuring um, because you see other people problem solving and you see that other people are living quite interesting, fulfilling lives and sometimes having a laugh and having fun along the way. And uh, all of those things can alleviate anxiety quite considerably sometimes. You know, and I, I hope that doesn't sound too simplistic, but... Um, not you at know, all. It, it, it sounds it sounds very realistic to me, and, uh, and that's what we really appreciate about that comment. Thank you, Jackie. Um, talking about having a laugh, I'm going to try and come to Kath, who I know wants to make a comment, and if not, if that doesn't work, then we'll come over to Trish. <laughs> this is my last attempt, isn't it? If it's sent down toast, if this doesn't work, can you hear me? Good, good. so far. Good, good, good. I mean, Jackie, that, that was just a beautiful description of, of the different elements that can cause anxiety. I think uncertainty is such a major part to play at the beginning of the process, which is why certainty and diagnosis can be such a relief, albeit one with a double-edged sword. Um, and I think that holistic approach in terms of anxiety um, and tailoring that multifaceted approach to the stage and to the cause of anxiety is so important. That's one of the things I think RDS does really well. Um, you know, we look at the roles, um, the individuals that are involved, whether it's the family or the, the patient themselves, whether it's part of the disease, which it can be in some of these diseases, or whether it's part of a change in the relationship. We have the things that Nikki mentioned earlier in turn and, and Trish about support. We also got active psychological intervention that we can tailor to the individual. Um, and then we do have medication that is a part of treatment with anxiety. I think we have to include it as something we think about, but in the round. And the anxiety about things like self-employment is massive. I've seen so many people that have just not known how to manage that situation. And so things like vocational rehabilitation and exit strategies, I think are really, really important. Um, so yeah, I think there's a lot we can do better and we need to, as part of this group, develop some of those elements, I think, because it's so important in, in young onset. Thank you. And just before we draw to a close, I'm mindful of time. Trish, I think you wanted to make a comment too. Yeah, I did, I think. I mean, um, I, you know, I'm listening to what the lived experience today from John. I mean, I think probably one thing we need in life is to take as much, much control as possible. Mm -hmm. You can't necessarily control your disease, but you control other things to make living with the disease a little bit easier. And so planning power of attorney, making sure you know the people who might need to make decisions for you or maybe not in the future, depending on your capacity, making sure that you might have planned to have some financial planning, some advice, planning things that you want to look forward to, staying involved in the bigger picture of life, such as, you know, the planet or the garden or volunteering, something bigger than you. This is, this is something that you can make happen. And it's lovely to hear Jackie's partner um, getting involved in art and an enormous new world opened for him and perhaps he could really control each painting as well or each sculpture or whatever it is that he made you know it had a beginning a middle and an end I think we all need some control in our lives otherwise the world becomes really scary so I'd say plan and take control of what you can Great. Thank you, panel, so much. Uh, mindful of time, I'll hand back to Kath to close the meeting, but just to say there are a couple of questions um, which we haven't had time to address around uh, independence, around reassuring people both living with a diagnosis or caring for someone who is uh, who are experiencing separation anxiety from their partner, whether they're out and about or just in the next room. Um, and also some questions about volunteering um, that we'll try and sweep up together um, and share with you uh, via the uh, communication after the meeting. Um, but huge thanks to all the panel and over to Kath. Thank you, Seb, for masterful chairing as always. And thank you all for the questions. I'm sorry we couldn't get through them all, but as, as Seb has said, we will get back to them. And just to round up, and I think it's been a fantastic session. I feel like there's so much more we could, we could continue to discuss on this. We've just scratched the surface, but it's a really rich vein that we need to explore further, I think, from the point of view of this discussion with Trish's expertise, Nikki's expertise, Jackie's experience. It's all uh, and your input, I think we can really build 
a, a, a way of helping with work and work questions within this group and for the RDS. So if you can continue your feedback, we can continue this discussion. Um, thank you to people like John who have given such powerful examples of the positive experiences as well as the difficulties and challenges of, of change and, and giving up job. And um, I look forward to the small peer support groups taking off and developing um, and to further conversations on this and other topics. So with that, um, it's four o'clock, so I'm going to finish. Thank you very much, everybody. I look forward to the next meeting and to the next theme. Hello, my name is Eva Tate and I'm the Major Appeals Manager and Manager of the Rare Dementia Support Fund held by the charity The National Brain Appeal. The National Brain Appeal raises money as the dedicated charity for the National Hospital for Neurology and Neurosurgery and UCL Queen's Square Institute of Neurology. The National Brain Appeal raises funds for Rare Dementia Support's 2,000 members to help individuals living with rare and early onset forms of dementia, their families, friends and healthcare professionals. And we also hold several other funds for FTD and dementia research. The funding helps not only the support group meetings in London, but also the regional support groups, admin and support staff and all other associated expenses, including the new online support groups. When, when things return to normal, there are travel and accommodation bursaries available to help members attend the meetings. This year, we've raised our fundraising target to 300,000, and this will rise further to 350,000 by 2022 to develop and extend the service in the areas of education, support and research, with the ultimate aim that everyone affected by a form of rare dementia will have access to specialist information and support, as well as contact with other people with a similar condition. We apply for grants from grant making trusts, foundations and livery companies and have a wonderful group of supporters, some of whom are here today, who fundraise for us in an amazing variety of ways. We would love it if you would like to sign up to our RDS fundraising newsletter to hear more of these stories and receive news of how we can support this community. We have had people do head shaves for us. We have had um, a gentleman drive across the Mongolian steppe in a VW polo and we have lots of people who take part in runs and virtual runs as well. At the end of February, we held a gala dinner called Mission Possible, where we raised 110,000 for the expansion of Red Dementia support. And we are delighted to announce that in line with this expansion, the charity is committed to raise up to 7 million to create the world's first centre of excellence for Rare Dementias. If anyone would like to discuss any fundraising ideas or the new Capital Appeal, um, please do feel free to email me or my colleague Alexis, our senior fundraising manager, who will speak about the innovative new ways you can be involved in fundraising for RDS, even during this challenging time. Thank you very much. Hello, my name is Alexis Gebby and I'm the senior fundraising officer at the National Brain Appeal. Um, I just want to start off by saying a huge thank you to all of you who already fundraise for RDS. We really appreciate all of your incredible efforts, especially at this difficult time. My role at the National Brain Appeal is to look after all the amazing people taking on various fundraising activities for us. We have had people challenging themselves to run marathons, cycle long distances, climb mountains and even take on skydives, all whilst raising money for RDS. We also have wonderful fundraisers out in the community who organise golf days, hold coffee mornings, host choir and carol concerts, and even shave their heads. These people ensure that more people like you can be supported through Rare Dementia support. If you're interested in becoming one of our fundraising heroes, then please do contact me. I am here to support you with your fundraising, and I'm more than happy to chat about any ideas that you may have. While at the moment it isn't possible to take part in a sporting challenge or hold a big fundraising gathering in your local community, we do have some fundraising ideas, such as taking on a solo virtual run or walk, hosting a quiz for your friends or family online, asking for birthday donations in lieu of going out, or even donating money that you may be saving by not travelling to work or buying your daily coffee. Do get in touch with me if you would like to get involved. In the meantime, take care and we hope to see you soon.